Okay, well, welcome everybody on this gorgeous uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's presentation, Proud, uh, Prepared and Protected protected, excuse me, with Angus Campbell. Uh, my name is Kathy Arsenault. I'm the practice consultant here at the Association of New Brunswick Licensed Practical Nurses, and I will just be serving as moderator for today's presentation. Uh, so of course, as you guys are all well aware, this is Nursing Week, um, and today is International Nurses Day to coincide with uh, Florence Nightingale's birthday. Uh, so on behalf of all of ANBLPN, we again just want to take a moment uh, to wish you all a very happy Nursing week. We hope that you've been having a good week and that you've been able to find a little bit of time to, to celebrate yourself and your colleagues and of course the, uh, the profession of nursing as a whole. Uh, throughout the pandemic, you guys have continued to provide that compassionate, ethical and competent care, uh, despite all those massive, massive challenges that have been presented to you. Uh, and of course, we just cannot thank you enough for that. Uh, as a small token of our appreciation, we have been offering these free educational uh, webinars all week long. So I hope you've been able to take part in a few of them. Um, there'll be one more opportunity tomorrow uh, at 10 o'clock. There's one with Neville McKay. Uh, and of course, we record all of our webinars as well. So if you've missed any, we will have those added to our website uh, by the beginning of next week. Uh, and if you want to share them with your colleagues as well. Uh, so I now have the pleasure of uh, welcoming and introducing you to our presenter today, which is Angus Campbell. Angus Campbell retired as Executive Director of Caregivers Nova Scotia in 2020. As a gay man and a former caregiver to his late partner and current caregiver to his 84-year-old friend, Angus does ensure that caregiving, LGBT, and seniors issues are heard by the various boards and committees that he sits on, including the Canadian Frailty Network. He's also a member of the Canadian Virtual Hospice Expert Team and has collaborated with researchers on many projects. He's given presentations and workshops discussing caregiving issues, resources for caregivers in Nova Scotia, and safe medicines for seniors and caregivers to audiences of caregivers, seniors, geriatric grand rounds, telehealth, and emergency medical services. His proud, prepared, and protected presentation highlights a collection of online resources to assist people who identify as 2SLGBTQ+, to access and receive inclusive, respectful care. So today, Angus does ask the question, as a healthcare professional, do you feel prepared to offer people from my community appropriate care? So please join me in welcoming Angus Campbell. Well, thanks so much, Kathy. Um, and also thanks to Joanne uh, and Kathy for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I'm pleased to be here representing Canadian Virtual Hospice. Um, and you uh, may not know it, but we have 17 online platforms and serve over 2.3 million people each year. So today I'm going to just uh, go through a, a review of all the inclusive care resources that we have uh, targeting my community, and that's the 2SLGBTQ plus community. Um, and these have been developed for patients, uh, for their unpaid family and friend caregivers, and also for you, healthcare professionals. Um, these resources, uh, there's 41 of them in total, and they consist of guides, of um, articles, videos, um, infographics that you can download and, and um, uh, hang on your wall to, to show people that uh, uh, you are familiar with uh, a number of the issues. Um, these products were developed by uh, people who identify as 2SLGBTQ+. Um, there were over 40 community organizations and the Canadian Virtual Hospice uh, that all came together to do this. Um, all the resources are free and they're avail available at the virtualhospice.ca website or Porte Palliative. Um, and I'll be uh, uh, distributing, or, or uh, Kathy will be distributing uh, a list uh, of, of shortcuts that you can uh, to, to get there if there are any particular resources that you'd like to see. Um, all the resources are available in French. And um, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box. If I don't answer them during the presentation, I'll gladly do it at the end. Um, 
And um, many people, when I've spoken to them over Zoom, asked me about this painting behind me, uh, and it's of the Aspie Falls, <clears throat> excuse me, in Cape Breton. So, okay, let's see if this is going to work for me. Uh, it's not a, oh, there we go. Uh, so thank you. So uh, I have to start, uh, first of all, by saying thank you to Health Canada, who uh, gave a financial uh, contribution that we were able to correct, uh, create these resources. And let's start right off from the, what does 2SLGBTQ plus stand for? Um, so some of you may know this, so please uh, uh, forgive me for going through it again, but uh, Two-Spirit uh, is really mostly the Indigenous uh, people who identify as having both a masculine and a fem feminine spirit. And that could also be in reference to their uh, sexuality, uh, gender, or even spiritual identity. Uh, lesbian, uh, women who are attracted to other women, gay or men who are attracted to other men, bisexual are men and women who are attracted to other men and women. Um, transgender people are people whose gender identity, so the gender that they relate to is different from the gender that they were born with um, or thought to be uh, born at birth. So we often will call these people trans, and, um, and it's really important to recognize that not all trans people have had their gender affirming surgery. Um, you may have also heard the term cisgender. I don't have it up here, but cisgender, uh, I would be a cisgender gay man because I was born male and I still identify as male. Um, uh, queer or questioning, but queer is, is often it's, it's a, refers to a rejection of labels uh, for gender and sexual orientation. It's used most frequently by people under the age of 50. Um, I'm well over that age and I just wanted to let you know, not everyone in the community um, appreciates being called queer. Uh, for a lot of us, it was really, uh, held against us when we, when we were younger and still fright, fighting for rights. Uh, so some people have taken it on and uh, adopted the expression where other people have not. Um, and the plus sign uh, really refers to someone who's gender fluid. Uh, so their, their, their gender uh, or, or uh, sexual identity uh, changes over time. Um, so I just wanted to ask uh, a quick poll because I don't like to uh, make any assumptions uh, as best I can. So I have a poll to, just to find out, and this is anonymous, and I think I have to, do I, uh, here we go. And I think, Kathy, actually, this is your. Yep, I'll launch that poll now for them okay. to see. So just hang tight here. Uh, so you guys are going to see a question on your two questions appear on your screen that you can vote on. And as you said, it is anonymous. It just comes in as a percentage. Uh, so you don't have to worry about your name being shown or anything. So you should see it now. Just asking how familiar are you with people who self-identify as 2SLGBTQ+. So if you're very familiar somewhat or not at all. And the second question is just how familiar are you with issues that may impact the health care of members of the 2S LGBTQ plus community? So we'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Still see people voting, so just tick it off there. So we'll give you about five more seconds if you could just vote. almost everybody. <laughs> we'll do a three, two, <laughs> one. So I'll just end the poll and share the results. So we're all over the place, which is not surprising. So for the first question, you've got 25% are very familiar, um, 65 say somewhat, and 10% say not at all. 
And your second question is 20% very familiar, 65% somewhat, and 15% uh, not at all familiar. So I'll just take that down and back to you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for your uh, answers there. Um, I'm really hoping that the, the content that uh, I cover today um, uh, will uh, resonate with you and that you uh, may learn from some of this, even for the people who are uh, uh, quite familiar. I will just, there we go. I thought I'd start with uh, under, understanding the healthcare rights of people in my community. Um, we actually created this Canadian Healthcare Bill of Rights for people um, that, uh, you know, people can, can uh, either download the 17 page PDF, um, they could uh, also download, or you could download uh, uh, an infographic that it can go on your car, on, on your wall, or um, there's also a wallet card that someone could have. Um, these resources that we've created, some are for members of the community, others are definitely for healthcare professionals like yourselves, um, and some are for both. And I just think it's always a good idea for both the professionals and the patients and their caregivers to have a look at both if they have the time to do that. Um, it helps us understand one another more. So this bill, uh, this, these Bill of Rights, um, they outline patient rights uh, when accessing healthcare. Uh, they highlight uh, what decisions they're entitled to make. And it details what actions someone could take if they're not receiving access to respectful and inclusive care. Um, it, it really, the whole idea is that we want people to feel safe and uh, freed from discrimination. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the, what is inclusive care. And the first is, you know, we need to accept and welcome uh, all people as they are. So just a few weeks ago, I was driving down my street and there was someone who appeared quite obviously male to me. Um, and he was wearing uh, a dress. Um, and, you know, so the thing is, like, do we think in our minds of, oh, my gosh, there's a man in a dress, or, oh, that's a really effeminate guy, or it could be, say, oh, that's a butch woman, or, you know, we may get these um, automatic assumptions and uh, feelings about people when we see them, and we can very well be conditioned to them as we're growing up. Um, but when they're coming to see us as healthcare professionals, right, they're coming to seek assistance and they're human beings. And, you know, they could be, they could be patients, they could be family friend caregivers, and they could be at a very, very vulnerable point in their lives. So it's, it's really important that we, we think about the person as an individual. Um, no, we also have to acknowledge discrimination, uh, if not from ourselves, you know, then from others. Um, you know, over the years, my community has been badly damaged by discrimination. Uh, we're seeing now in, uh, you know, in our neighbors to the south, just how things, you know, don't say gay in Florida. Uh, we're, you know, we, we see around the world the horror stories of what happens to members of my community. Um, you know, I, like they can't exist in the Middle East, they can't exist in Russia, um, you know, people can't have pride parades, there's, there's just so many things where we're, we're discriminated against um, because we're trying to show the world that, you know, we're just as good as anybody else. We're not exactly the same, but most of us, you know, uh, is the same as any other human being, but we have difference in our genders and in our sexual orientation. And uh, we also have to 
recognize some unique risks and challenges, uh, supports and strengths uh, within the community. And I'm gonna get into that uh, in a, a, here in the next slide. We're gonna talk a bit more. So this particular um, slide, this comes from the Planning for My Care resource. And there's just a few things that I wanted to point out to you, first of all. So if you compare the general population to my community, um, we are three times more likely to be single. Um, we're also less likely to have children who will care for us uh, when we're unwell or frail. And also number four, because I'm not gonna read all of them to you, I'm gonna let you look at the resource and, and uh, online. Um, we're also more susceptible to circumstances of social isolation. Uh, now, we've all really experienced social isolation uh, for the last two years. So we know what it's looking like for us. Um, this is what a, a number of members of my community live with every day, uh, with or without uh, COVID. Uh, and so, so, for example, if somebody is gay or lesbian and they live in a small town, they may not have a social network uh, around them. Uh, so, you know, they may only get to see those people when they, uh, you know, come to, to town or to the city, um, uh, you know, once a month or something. So they might not have the same um, connection of a social network. Uh, we also are seeing a lot, more, many more studies being done right now on the whole idea of isolation and loneliness. You know, the UK now has a uh, Department of Loneliness, uh, and it's really because of the seniors, um, and we're seeing that that affects their health so much. So we're seeing more studies regarding that now, and here in Canada too, and in, in the States. I just want to point out on some of the factors, there's two factors that I think is really important that negatively impact healthcare. Uh, and this is including palliative care. Um, and the first is it, man, some members of my community actually expect discrimination or stigma, and therefore that prevents them from accessing care. And the fourth one is that how there may be increased pressure on the caregivers of, of my community. And it could be from accessing care late or not at all. And that wraps back to the first one again about people expecting discrimination or stigma. Uh, just to let you know, these are all uh, peer reviewed uh, facts that, uh, uh, and the, the citations for them are at the end of this particular planning for my care uh, resource. I also want to talk about discrimination. Um, believe it or not, unfortunately, some members of my community have had to wait longer for care or being denied service. Um, I, I cannot uh, quote any cases in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, but I do know of some in Ontario. Um, being misgendered, this is a really uh, big one. Um, for many trans people. So, uh, you know, their preferred pronouns um, and they aren't being respected for that. And you may, you could think about the infamous uh, university professor incident who refused to call people by their preferred pronouns. Um, and just a, a little note on that, the number one pronouns that are uh, often overlooked are they and them. Uh, so someone who wishes to use the pronoun they and them, which is plural, and yet they're, you know, there's a single, we're referring to a single person. A number of people still have trouble using that. Uh, so just to, just to let you know, that's, that's a big one. If somebody says they or them to you, or try to make a notation regarding that. Um, uh, and uh, I'm sure they'll uh, really appreciate your effort. Uh, I also have some practical tips on how we can do a lot of this and, and that we can you know, get away from this uh, discrimination. 
Um, having a partner called friend. Well, I personally relate to this uh, with my late partner uh, who was hospitalized for nine months and then he was at home for nine months uh, where he chose to die. Uh, so there, was a f there were a few healthcare professionals. Um, oh, and by the way, I love nurses. Happy Nurses Week. Um, uh, because they really uh, saved my bacon and his as well uh, when he was in the hospital. They, they came to our defense, so thank you. Um, but uh, there were a few healthcare professionals, you know, who constantly called Paul my friend. And I'd have to correct them and say, you know, he's my partner, you know, we've lived together for years. And um, you know, in sickness and in health, so friend, and it doesn't cut it. Um, so, but there's times when, you know, we don't, uh, you know, you can't fight every battle in order to win the war. Sorry, Angus, are you still there? Oh, technology. Sorry, people. We'll just see if uh, he seems frozen on my screen. <laughs> just hang tight. He might have to log out and log back in. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Oh, I see. He probably just got kicked out and he will come back in a moment. Apologies. He must be having a connection issue on his end. So we'll just wait a moment. <laughs> Oh, are you back, I, Angus? There we I'm, go. You're back. <laughs> I'm back. Okay. Sorry. I don't uh, I don't know how far you heard me before it cut out. You were just still talking about a partner called friend, uh, and then you were frozen and I was having a panic attack. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll throw it back to you. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Good thing that IT degree comes in handy every now and then. Um, so anyway, yes. Yeah, so calling somebody's partner friend I won't get into the long the long story but the one way that the one time that we smiled about it was the um uh, the hairstylist who just couldn't say partner and just referred to Paul as my cousin and we thought okay that that's fine enough at that point she gave a good haircut um uh, also uh, you know we along that same line about potential discrimination is that I know for when, you know, Paul was in bed and I was having to say good, good, good night to him at the hospital. Of course, we had to close the curtains between the two beds, you know, because, um, you know, he never shared a, a room with, a, with a, another gay man. It was always a, a straight man. And so, you know, we didn't, there was even like some potential shame on our own part about, um, we didn't want to insult anybody, but do we do we really need to do that? Or is there some way that healthcare professionals can help us? I know that the nurses at the hospital were very good and they said, oh, let's just close the curtains here for a bit. And they made it like they were doing it. So that was that was really, really nice. Um, and, uh, you know, being shamed about our appearance or behavior. Um, just like I said about the, the man that I had seen in a dress, you know, my, my community is very, very diverse. And um, uh, as, as is the general population, but we also have in this subpopulation, you know, a, a very diverse within it. So, um, so some people may, you know, dress or act feminine or masculine or androgynous. So 
I guess my big question for you to think about is, should any of this affect their healthcare? Um, you know, as healthcare professionals, do you really think that any of this could affect a patient and their health? So we have to be careful not to repeatedly explain or ask questions about personal history, appearance, behavior, or even life choices. And we're gonna get into that next. Um, here, I'll just advance oh, it for you. Thank you, okay. We'll do that from here on in and I'll just say next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. <Yep. laughs> so let's look at, at, you know, how can we pragmatically, practically deliver inclusive care? And the first thing that we really have to do is that we need to identify a potential bias or prejudice that we might have, right? So like, what are your feelings around the two S L G B T Q plus community, um, the 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 issues that relate to them. Um, what about pregnancy, or adoption, or surrogacy, or parenting, and gender reassignment? Have you thought about those? Do you have you explored them to say, oh wait, like maybe I think about this and I need to do a little bit more reading or get a bit more education on this. You know, so that's why we really need to examine our assumptions. Um, and this is where we do need to pay attention to a person's name. So their chosen name, their pronouns, their gender identity, or their gender expression, which we always talk about too. Because if we make assumptions, we may end up with inaccurate uh, conclusions. And this can really harm a patient. Uh, you know, uh, the relationship between the nurse and the patient, as you know, is so very special that we, we need to keep that relationship on a very uh, good, even keel and showing support. So, you know, again, coming back to the language, um, you know, are you comfortable using they, them? Because that's, that's one of the ones that we... Uh, see, and if you don't know somebody's pronouns, just ask, and I'm going to show you how to do that in uh, in a couple slides. Um, you know, when we say pay attention to the language as well, I'm talking about uh, asking questions in a way that lets the patient know your goal is to understand their needs while providing the best possible care. So, you know, is your, is your question related to the patient's care needs or, or could it possibly be your own curiosity or some other personal need? Um, you know, what do you do if you misgender somebody, right? Well, here's the easy solution. Apologize, you know, I'm sorry. I meant to call you such and such, um, you know, and keep the apology brief. Um, so that doesn't uh, become about you, right? And we're going to talk about a few more examples of this later. Um, if, if somebody does correct you, um, try not to be defensive. Just be sincere and brief. Um, try questions like, which pronouns would you like me to use, right? So we can, we can get to it that way. We can follow the person's lead in their names, you know, how they use names and pronouns and relationships with others. Listen to that carefully, because that will help us, you know, uh, with our following questions. Um, and acknowledge and respond to the needs relating to gender identity and expression. So grooming, clothing, hormone replacement. Um, I just got an an email from uh, a few days ago from a gay man that I know, and he wanted to know uh, what a trans band was. And I thought, well, that's good, he's asking. He doesn't know, and he's, he's sending me an email to ask. And so, you know, this is one way that trans men, so female to men, 
can actually bind their chest so that they can appear more uh, flat. Um, and this is somebody who has not gone, uh, you know, had a du double mastectomy yet. Um, we have to also consider, uh, well, identify and include chosen family. So that's really important to people, um, you know, for, for just in my own situation, it was challenged that, you know, uh, by Paul's family uh, that I was not his partner and I did not have the right to make decisions. Um, so, and unfortunately he was delirious for the first month of his illness. But thank goodness he came around just long enough for the doctors to ask him. Doctor asked him, and there were two nurses present. And that's when the doctor said, okay, Angus is the substitute decision maker. Paul has requested that. And that this is where the nurses defended me to the very end. So, um, so we, it's really important to identify and include the chosen family. Uh, with caregivers, um, one in six caregivers is not just to my community, this is right across the whole unpaid family friend caregiver spectrum. One in, in six caregivers in Canada is not related by blood or marriage. One in six. So it's really important that we find out whose people, uh, who people uh, choose as their, as their family and who's going to be involved in their health care. Um, we have to consider the impacts of multiple deaths and trauma. Um, so one example of this is uh, Indigenous, uh, you know, LGBTQ plus or two-spirited people, as well as immigrants or refugees, they may be experiencing both personal and collective grief due to colonialism or cultural upheaval, and that is going to affect their health. Um, you know, grief can be, it can include mixed uh, uh, feelings, right? So a, a trans person who's undergoing gender-affirming surgery may be feeling a loss of the person and gender that they knew at the same time with being excited uh, about the new gender and person that they're going to become. But there can be really, it, it can be a traumatizing uh, experience. Um, and it's really important, I, I think you know already probably to engage with the whole person. So this is where we learn about and we acknowledge, you know, somebody's strengths and resiliencies, you know, as well as their challenges. You know, what, what gives them a sense of meaning? Um, you know, as an ally, it's, it's really important to take responsibility and take action to end discrimination. Uh, this oppression negatively affects my community. And I just think it's, it's the same thing for me that, you know, as a gay man, uh, I stand up for women's rights and always have. Um, so I just think it's, we need to work together as, as best we can. Next slide, please. So when delivering inclusive care, so we know that the, your attitudes and belief, uh, beliefs can uh, lead you to make assumptions and judgments that may not be accurate or helpful. So the way you engage with your patients is the most important indicator of your openness, respect, and inclusivity. And it really does have a direct impact on their health. Um, I just want you to know that these resources were put together by so many different people. And when I saw some, some of the things as we were developing them, I, I didn't have the same understanding, even I, you know, like I'm in my mid sixties and, um, you know, and I have known many people across the spectrum within my community, uh, both here and in Vancouver. And the, um, I, I learned a lot from uh, helping put to these together. And, and in some of the discussions that I had, especially with the number of trans uh, folk, um, some of the discussions I had were really eye-opening. So next slide, please. So this is from um, the resource, How to Be an Ally. 
So instead of saying something like, should I use your real name or your nickname? Um, how about what name would you like me to call you? And which gender do you identify as? And which pronoun would you like me to use? And may I ask about your sexual orientation? And which people do you consider to be family? So all of these are very open-ended questions and they're, it's, they're, um, and they're polite. They're actually polite and people you know, uh, respond usually quite well to them. So this might be something that you consider. So how to be an ally is the name of that resource. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, please. And Kathy, do you have any questions so far? Not so far, but if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to just type them in the Q&A box and you always have the option to send your question anonymously as well if you, uh, if you don't want us to see your name. So I'll keep an eye on it. Thank you. So this is the landing page. It's a little squished here uh, for the 2S LGBTQ you know, proud, prepared, and protected uh, um, resources. And so uh, the reason that we developed these is that we saw that there really was a gaping hole in uh, care resources and specifically palliative care resources tailored to my community. So this is when we got together a few years ago and started um, uh, putting this all together. And uh, so, just that you familiarize yourself a little bit with that um, there, but let's let's to go to the next slide, please. So, uh, planning for my care. Uh, this focuses on care conversations, and it's it's for all sexual and gender diverse uh, people as well. It's available as a fillable PDF file uh, that can be saved, it can be printed, and uh, it can be printed as a blank and then completed. Uh, so I, I really recommend people, you know, uh, take a look at this themselves. I think we, this is a, like a pre-advanced care planning uh, tool um, because, and you're going to see with some of the questions we ask, you don't normally see in a regular advanced care planning uh, tool. So one of the things that I suggest to people is that they complete this, print it out, and then have it at the ready when they go to complete their own ACP. So whether that is, I know here in, in Nova Scotia, through the Legal Information Society in Nova Scotia, they have an online uh, advanced care planning tool that you can do, again, for free. They have an online free will that somebody can complete. So um, it could be something through the legal uh, services in New Brunswick, uh, but this is really good of getting some of this uh, written down ahead of time uh, such that we can uh, have these conversations. So we can move to the next slide, please. There we go. So we ask things here, you know, we want like most ACPs or pre-ACPs, you know, we want people to think about um, what's important uh, to you and, and, and address the particular concerns. And very importantly is, you know, plan who is going to speak for you if you cannot speak for yourself or, you know, uh, whom do you want to make decisions for you uh, if you cannot for yourself? So in this case, if we take a look at the top left, we're right away asking, I'm currently on hormone replacement therapy. I, I've never seen that in an advanced care plan, you know, to ask somebody about that. And then we also, you know, do you want to talk about it or not with your physicians or your healthcare providers? And um, it, do you want it to be stopped if, a certain event happens. So we're asking about that. We're asking about surgical procedures and specifically about sex assigned at birth. Um, so this does not apply to everybody, but people can fill in as little as they like or as long as they like. And we also really get into safety and privacy because we need, um, we, you know, we need our patients to feel safe. 
And so someone may request that all their physical exams be conducted by, you know, a male or a female, or they might not have any preference. But we specifically ask them, are there things that make you feel unsafe? And what kind of things would help you feel safe? So, you know, whether it's the, the family being around them more or helping out with certain things or, um, uh, you know, if, if, if somebody is transgender, they might want to be dressing a certain way or they, you know, there's so many different factors. Um, and this is, where I, this is where I really learned how much of how much discrimination the transgender community has experienced uh, accessing healthcare. Um, some of the stories I heard were uh, horrific. Um, and this is just to share one with you quickly, because I don't want to go too long here. The, um, you know, it was, it was a, somebody who did not have anything like this. It was a young trans person, um, did not have anything like this completed, did not have a will, did, no advanced care plan whatsoever, no partner. And um, this person had transitioned to female and um you know an accident happened and um they died and the parents refused to acknowledge the transition refused to acknowledge the new name refused to acknowledge the new gender and that person was buried as a male with his male name so there is nothing um, to recognize this person as to, you know, who they wanted to be. So I really, you know, would urge you to, you know, talk to people about, have you looked at this particular resource? Because this is a, a, a good one for people. Um, and also in planning for my care, the next slide, please. Um, so we talk about intimate care preference, uh, uh, um, preferences. Right. And, you know, do, for terms, because some people don't refer to breasts. If someone's had a double mastectomy and they've transitioned to male, uh, they probably don't want to use the word or they may not want to use the word breasts. Uh, it's the same thing regarding genitals. And then we specifically ask these oh, people like, oh, what do you not want used? And so we again, we ask uh, these questions. We give the opportunity for people to tell us more of their story. And this makes it easier for healthcare professionals uh, during intake, reading a chart, you know, the, this tells us more information that we might not uh, uh, otherwise ask. Uh, next slide, please. We also have something else called My Choices for Safe and Inclusive Healthcare. Um, and this really is a, like an ACP in some sense, or the pre-ACP, but it just is like somebody's choices that they may want to make uh, or, or uh, complete this information for them. So it helps them have conversations with you. Um, this really does help them uh, plan for their future care. And this is an opportunity to share information such as emergency contacts. Um, next slide, please. So this is somebody's wishes for care, right? So, and this can start those conversations. So if they were to get very sick, you know, how much information do they want shared about their sexual orientation or gender identity with the medical team, for example? Um, how much information would you like to know about your own illness? So we ask these questions that people um, have an opportunity. Again, not everyone will answer every question, but um, they have the opportunity to hear. Again, this is a, a printable, savable PDF. Someone can do it online, they can do it in, um, uh, print it out and do it by hand and have it with them. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. So of the 41 resources at Proud, Prepared and Protected, uh, we have 16 articles. Uh, so why inclusivity matters, uh, how to find inclusive care. Uh, so, and then here for you, and you've heard me talk about this, how to provide inclusive care. How about managing difficult situations and about getting the care that you need. 
Now I have prepared, um, it's four pages, and this is, sorry, I'm trying to do it where the sun doesn't shine in my window. Uh, so sort of the top 12 uh, resources uh, from Proud Prepared Protected, and then as well as some other resources for you that um, you can just click on them and it can take you right there. And if we could go to the next slide, please. So if you only have time to read one resource, please have a look at this one. It's just, it, it, it's, uh, it's straightforward uh, and it really helps you with a, a bunch of questions. Um, and, you know, we covered some of it here today, uh, but uh, it is online um, and uh, as well, you can download it. Um, so uh, our next slide. Um, unfortunately, this uh, video is not working for us. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, Dr. Kim Aquaviva is a nurse, uh, and she is um, uh, she is a, a considered an, an expert uh, in the LGBTQ plus community uh, in how to deliver care. Uh, and uh, you know, if if there's a chance, it, it is on the website. It is in the in the short list that I'm I'm sending to you as well. Uh, so now if we could go to, to the next slide, please, and that's going to require Kathy. Oh, so, sorry, yep. so I'll just launch the next poll to you all. There's three questions there, so hang on one second. There you go. So just do you have a better understanding of what inclusive care means? Yes, no, or somewhat? Do you feel that you're more able to be an ally to the community? Yes or no? And do you feel better prepared to help advocate for members of the two SLGBTQ plus community? So if you could just uh, answer those questions. There's three there, so we'll give you a few moments to do that. We have about 10 more seconds to answer if you wouldn't mind participating. And just a reminder, we don't see any names. It just comes in as a percentage, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so I'll just bring down the poll. Seems so slow. Don't one more person there. Okay, so I'll share those results with everybody now. Uh, so most of you at 89% feel that they now have a better understanding of what inclusive care me means, 11% somewhat. 100% uh, of you said that you feel that you are more able to be an ally to the community. And 84% of you said you feel better prepared to help advocate for members of the 2SLGBTQ plus community um, with 16% feeling somewhat on that one. So take that down and continue on. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for, uh, for uh, answering those questions. I, I think that um, um, people, it sounds like you do, uh, that you're, you're getting this even more. Uh, so I'm, I'm really glad about that. Um, if there are questions, please ask. I'm, I just want to give you a few other resources to look at, and you can ask me about anything. It's not only, you know, anything with Canadian Virtual Hospice, um, but, uh, um, uh, but here are some of these uh, other resources that you may want to take a look at. And so next slide, please, Kathleen. So we have a series called mygrief.ca. And there's all kinds of different topics uh, in terms of, you know, relationship uh, grief, uh, pregnancy and infant loss. Um, there, there's just everything. You'll see the, the new one just under view topics. 
uh, up there is module 20. This is a new module called as uh, illness progresses and it deals with neurodegenerative uh, diseases. Um, originally we had nine modules, there's now 27 and we have some more that are coming. Uh, at the bottom of this page and at the, the bottom of most pages of, uh, of uh, virtualhospice.ca, um, you can sign up for um, a monthly newsletter. And uh, so it's not, I just want you to say, you know, we're not looking for money or anything like that. Um, uh, it's to let you know what's new. And so uh, we, because there, there's a lot going on. Um, and the next slide, please. So we have Indigenous cultural safety training, uh, specifically for advanced illness, palliative care, and grief. And you can do this and receive a certificate of completion. It's free, like all of our uh, resources. And, uh, and it's just uh, three modules. So it's self-paced. And uh, you may want to do that. It uh, could help you uh, with your nursing uh, career. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we can't show this video, but um, uh, coming soon, how soon? Next week, we're launching uh, 10 caregiving videos. It's actually one is an introduction and then nine different ones. Um, and uh, that's a lot of hands-on uh, how to do things. And we discuss communications and all kinds of things. So if you know, you know, unpaid family friend caregivers, have them come to Canadian Virtual Hospice, please, or virtualhospice.ca, um, and uh, we can get them uh, hooked up with this before we actually launch it, if they like, uh, or um, when it does go live uh, next week. Um, we also have uh, something that I don't have a slide for, and it's going to launch in a few weeks, and it too is supporting caregivers, and it doesn't necessarily mean um, uh, caregivers of people who are palliative, uh, but it's also for, you know, the full spectrum. So from the beginning of somebody's caregiving journey, uh, it's called Care Hub, but it's also for patients or people living with, uh, um, well, chronic or life-limiting illness. So, um, so it's, uh, we have that available. And then the next slide, please. Here we go. That's it. So I've done. Have I hope, haven't taken up too much of your time here, but if you have any questions. Not at all. Thank you, Angus. That was fantastic and a lot of really great resources there for people to, to become informed and to utilize for continuous learning. Um, so I'm just going to check. There's a few chats there. Uh, so lots of people thanking you. Surely helpful. Uh, lots of great information.